Dr. Masala. Yeah. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, all of you. You all are welcome for the session conducted by Sri Lanka Veterinary Association. And today webinar is on a common condition in pet cytosine bird uh, conducted by uh, Dr. Ganga Vijay Singh. So first of all, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Erandika Gunavardhana, the president of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association to welcome uh, all the participants for the today's webinar. Dr. Erandika Gunavardhana, the floor is over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Basala, for your kind words. So uh, again, uh, welcome you all for this uh, session conducted by Sri Lanka Veterinary Association. Actually, it is very highly impressive today that uh, we are we have a gathering of, uh, um, I mean, good gathering for this webinar today, especially from overseas, uh, the veterinarians. So my dear teachers and my dear colleagues and my dear fellow veterinarians and the, and the local veterinarians who are joining us with, uh, with us today uh, over mm -hmm. the hybrid platform. Uh, actually, as the SL, SLVA Sri Lanka, we, we thought of, you know, I mean, uh, deviating our topics uh, to, uh, to different, different uh, fielders, uh, fields and uh, with high di diversified. So for the enormous request made by the veterinarians, uh, uh, local and overseas uh, on these uh, cytosine diseases. So we thought of uh, getting down a very, a very uh, qualified resource person today, Dr. Ganga Jisinga, here with us uh, today to conduct the webinar. And meantime, I have some you know, announcements of our local veterinarians uh, who are joining uh, with the sessions uh, of the SLVA. So please update your membership. Uh, we have online uh, channels also uh, for, the, for your pay your uh, membership fees. So it will uh, better, it will serve us, uh, it will give us a chance to serve you all better. And meantime, Dr. Disnagar, our editor is uh, busy with the, your veterinarians mag magazine. So you can, con you can send your articles uh, uh, to the magazines these days. And meantime, we are conducting our annual uh, scientific sessions in coming October. So the, the, the sessions are open up for you submitting your abstracts. So please send your abstracts uh, to the website and uh, you can uh, contact Dr. Dilan and Dr. Neil, uh, Professor Neil for that. And please send your abstracts. And so they are, they are in the job of um, uh, preparing uh, for the scientific session this year and by the uh, Sri Lanka Veterinary Association. So with those words, I want to welcome you all for this uh, today's session, and uh, I'm, I uh, hand over the floor to uh, Dr. Vasara to uh, continue the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Randik, the president of uh, Sri Lanka Veterinary Association. So uh, regarding today's event, I um, mean the webinar, so we have certain uh, uh, guidelines to follow during this webinar. Uh, we kindly request you all to mute your mics uh, during the session. And we will be conducting the Q&A session followed by the main presentation. If you have any question during the presentation, it's better to send your uh, questions to this chat box. Uh, we will get all the questions and uh, we will present uh, those particular questions uh, after the uh, main presentation because we need, the, uh, we need to continue the flow uh, without any disturbances. Therefore, please send your questions if you have any concerns to chat box, so we will take all those uh, chats and uh, questions from uh, our participants. So now the next step is to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Ganga Vijay Singh. I will uh, I invite uh, Secretary of uh, Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, Dr. Sugat Premachandra, to introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Ganga Vijay Singh. Dr. Sugat, uh, the floor is over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Vasala. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, today's resource person, Dr. Ganga Vijay Singh. Dr. Ganga, Dr. Chandani Ganga Vijay Singh is currently attached to the Animal Health Division of the Department of Animal Production and Health, where she coordinates the project on mitigation of disease risk to livestock and human through targeted wildlife disease surveillance and facilitate investigation and research on wildlife diseases that threaten wildlife population, public health, and the economy. She completed her BBSc degree from the University of Peradene in 1997 and master degree in wild animal health in 2005 and veterinary epidemiology and public health in 2018 from the Royal Veterinary College, University of London. She joined the government service in 2000 and has worked as a zoo vet for 14 years at the Department of Nat National 
Zoological Garden, Sri Lanka. Since 2014, she is working at the Department of Animal Production and Health and has experience in wildlife disease surveillance for more than six years. She had undergone training at the London Zoo and Whipsnack Wild Animal Park, UK, Tarango Zoo and Wildlife Health and Conservation Center, University of Sydney, Australia, and the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative. She had conducted her M MSc research at Park Leap Wildlife and Safari Park, UK. Her current interest including development of national wildlife health program in Sri Lanka, broad scale wildlife disease risk assessment, wildlife forensic and leadership skills in wildlife health. Uh, I, on behalf of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, I would like to Dr. Ganga Vijay Singh to continue the program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sugar, for your kind uh, introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be here uh, uh, conduct, um, uh, with the SLVA uh, conducting this uh, session on uh, common conditions in pet uh, city science. So I will share my screen. Can you see? Yes, you can see, yes. Yes, Dr. Ganga, yes. So can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, pet, uh, like uh, today's talk is on common conditions in uh, pet uh, citizen birds. And as you all, all know, the, there are about uh, close to 400 species of citizens in the world. And they are mainly tropical species. And they are also found in Southern hemisphere uh, and some temperate parts. So they are the distribution wild citizens are not found in Europe. And uh, up, uh, like early nineties in Northern Af America, the last uh, cit uh, citizen species also have got extinct. So now you find them mainly in tropical regions and Southern hemisphere. Uh, temperate uh, southern hemisphere regions and citizens are commonly reared as pets because of their vibrant colors and their, per, their and their individual personalities and their affectionate uh, nature but uh, this pet trait had caused extinct of some other species in the world so it is there are um, the pet trade is highly regulated because of that and in Sri Lanka uh, According to the uh, Flora and Fauna Act, uh, native birds cannot be reared as pets. So, as the all the veterinarians should remember, so if the birds, are, if uh, pet owners bring birds to you, so remember that native Sri Lankan birds cannot be reared legally as pets. So, uh, in Sri Lanka, a lot of exotic uh, citizens are found uh, in the country as pets as well as the, there are a lot of breeders who breed uh, these species. So in, in our country, most common uh, pet uh, citizens are budgerigars, as you all know. I think all of you know budgerigars and the cockatiels are very common in Sri Lanka, as well as lovebirds, sulfur crested cockatoos, uh, African gray parrots and eclectus. These are some of the common uh, citizens that are reared as pets in the country. But uh, as I told you earlier, there are breeders who breed uh, like expensive uh, citizens in the country for exhibiting purposes and uh, for commercial purposes. So when you get a client who is interested in getting a pet uh, citizen, I will call them parrots because citizens are uh, like uh, they there are uh, this is a order uh, this order contains two uh, families in one family you get parakeets some uh, cornwalls lorries lorikeets macaws and the other uh, family contain uh, cockatoos and cockatiels so in this uh, if a person comes to you for an advice of choosing a citizen is very important because 
like they need to uh, consider the uh, space requirement and how much time they can spend with their uh, pet and uh, and these are very intelligent animals and social species so they need a lot of attention and some uh, time uh, can be uh, like very destructive so they have to consider about the family members as well as uh, um, like uh, other uh, conditions that they can provide for the bird. Otherwise, it can uh, affect the welfare of the animal, the bird. So you have uh, selecting a uh, cytosine is very important because uh, it's uh, there are not like keeping a dog or a cat. The cytosine uh, owners have to consider a lot of things. Because these uh, small bird, uh, these, these can the citizen can vary. The size varies, color varies, and their behavior and personality. There are a lot of changes uh, among species, but all of them are prey species. So they are easily excitable, easily frightened. That they can get easily stressed out due to environmental issues. And their lifespan is very long. So there are like large, uh, large macaws can live for like almost the same lifespan as human. So the, the like the owner has to be prepared for that uh, commitment. And these animals have not been domesticated like dogs or cats. So these are wild animals, but although captive born, they are still wild. They, are, they cannot be considered as domesticated. So they have their wild instincts, their uh, uh, various uh, requirements that uh, unless the breed like person who wants to get a citizen pet can uh, uh, provide those requirements, uh, it's not advisable to have a, a citizen pet. And these some most of them are social species and uh, they live in flocks in the wild. So they depend on each other flocks um, uh, because especially because they are prey species, they depend on the flocks uh, uh, security. And so some of them can be less turned to isolation. So if you are planning to have a one bird, you know, the, the owner has to spend a lot of time with the bird, interacting with the birds and taking care of the birds. So when you consider other husband considerations, air quality is very important because they are very susceptible to uh, pollutants in the air and uh, it can irritate their uh, respiratory tract and cause uh, problems. And social interactions, as I told you earlier, they are uh, flock species. Most of them live in large flocks. So they interact with the, each other in the wild. So you have to sometimes, if you are getting a flock species, it's better not to have a single bird but have, a, have them as uh, in flux. And intellectual stimulation is very important. And the diet. Diet is also very important because in the wild, they get a variety of uh, different uh, uh, food items. And foraging opportunities uh, is also important because most of them spend most of the time foraging in the wild. So the main thing you need to remember is try to mimic at like at least uh, basic requirements that are found in the wild. And they also need adequate sleep because they are diurnal prey species. So they need adequate sleep and rest uh, to keep their uh, physical and mental well-being. And stressors and exercise and appropriate housing and expression of species typical behaviors are also need to be considered when you have they? So, although uh, this, uh, when I was asked to do this presentation, I was asked to do the common diseases and the treatment. But almost more, all the diseases can be um, uh, prevented or minimize uh, minimize prevention of uh, such diseases if you have proper husbandry conditions. So that's why I thought I need to uh, emphasize on husbandry not mainly focusing on the disease conditions in these birds. So environment, when you, uh, the environment has to be uh, very clean and it has to be uh, secure and bird uh, should feel safe in its cage. 
and it should allow the uh, environment should allow the bird to exhibit normal behaviors. And at least it, the cage needs to be large enough for the bird to fully outstretch its wings and easily move about between perches. So when you compare these two pictures, you can see one is very bare. This is very like clean. This cage can be easily cleaned and it seems very sterile and it's spacious and it looks safe and secure. Um, and this doesn't look that uh, um, like easily cleanable uh, cage because uh, these wooden items are not that easily, this can, can't be that easily disinfected. But as I told you earlier, these animals are very intelligent. You can't just have them in bare spaces like this. If you're keeping them for long, like if it is for a short period, one or two hours, you keep them inside this cage and then let them out in the uh, house, then it's okay. But if a bird is kept in such bare environment, it can cause a lot of, uh, it can lead to a lot of stereotypic behaviors in the bird. So therefore, cage furniture is very important. So ensure that your bird has access to a variety of perches. Although these, uh, all these participants are veterinarians, and most of the pet owners come to you, come with all these husbandry issues. When before you start treating a bird, you need to carefully consider the husbandry practices and then correct the uh, issues before start, uh, then you can actually sometimes find the cause of the disease. So you have to tell them that uh, the cage furniture is, has, is very important, that they need a variety of perches provided like in different diameters and different substrates and which promotes the skin health and uh, mimic their natural perching behavior. Because if the perches are not suitable, sometimes it can damage their feet can cause the chronic pain and immunosuppression, which lead to so many other issues. So uh, small branches and uh, rope perches are ideal for perching because uh, they are, you can provide them in different uh, textures and different diameters, and they are uh, like not costly, so you can regularly uh, replace them. Because as I told you earlier, this natural uh, cage furniture can be uh, like, although it's uh, uh, safe for the bird and it's uh, good for the bird, it's uh, disinfectant and cleaning it thoroughly is not uh, that easy. So you have to use something um, cost effective. And so you can use, uh, can change those very regularly. So these are coconut uh, shells and different uh, sizes of perches, twigs and, twigs and branches and the choir and then uh, different sizes of uh, ropes. And hygiene is very important because um, the bird is kept in the same like same environment for almost throughout its life, other than the times when you take them, when they are taken out of the cage uh, to be in the house or in the garden. So you have to be able to uh, keep the cages very clean. And but the cleaning is uh, when you clean the cages. If you're cleaning, uh, it's better if you can take the bird out and uh, clean the cage and then wash it thoroughly to uh, remove all the traces of the disinfectants you use uh, before putting the bird. Otherwise, you have to use something very uh, like not harmful for the bird because most of the uh, cleaning uh, normal cleaning substances we use chemicals can cause uh, um, uh, problems to the birds because they are sensitive to a lot of toxic material. So uh, in this cage, it's, you can see like uh, bottom part is a wire mesh and there is a tray underneath it. So when the bird uh, droppings and food refusers will drop directly into the tray, so you can easily remove it and then clean the cage. So all these cages, food trays, and uh, water, uh, uh, water, waters has to be cleaned daily, uh, at least daily. Some uh, it's better if you can clean it uh, uh, twice a day, every uh, after every feed. So these uh, these uh, waters and feeders should have smooth edges, so it can be easily cleaned, and uh, they should be made of non-harmful material, because they uh, you have to remember these birds have very sharp beaks. So they will chew on things. So make sure that they can't destroy their waters and 
uh, feeders and uh, slow parts of it. So if you use wooden perters and hideaways, as I told you earlier, because they cannot be disinfectant thoroughly, you have to replace them regularly. So when you consider feeding, uh, the, as I told you before, the, there are a variety of uh, species of cytosines and they, their diet contains nuts, seeds, flowers, fruits, buds, and some um, uh, cytosines eat uh, insects. And some, uh, some species, there's one species which uh, even is a carrion feeder in New Zealand. So mainly, but most of them are like vegetarian. They, uh, they eat only plant materials, uh, plant-based materials. And there are some species like lorries and lorikeets, uh, they uh, eat uh, pollen and nectar. So depending on the species, uh, they, you rare, you need to provide a diet. But that has to be, you have to provide a variety of uh, things, um, not the same thing over and again, over and again over and over because it could lead to nutritional issues as well as behavioral issues. So yeah, although uh, people think that uh, feeding parrots with uh, high seed and high nut diet, it's not uh, good for their health because it can lead to fatty liver because the, it contains high fat and carbohydrates and high energy and it lacks vitamins and minerals. So you have to, best thing is, you try to provide the wild uh, diet, but it's not as uh, easily done as it says, but uh, you can provide vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds. So it, it will provide a variety. So uh, it will not cause that imbalance, nutritional imbalance. So, uh, and the other thing is when you provide them with a lot of uh, high fat carbohydrate uh, diets like a lot of nuts and seeds they will refuse to eat uh, fruits so they will uh, select pick and select the tastier ones more palatable food items and even though you provide a variety of food items they will only choose very tasty ones so these nuts and fruit uh, nuts and like nuts like almonds and sunflower seeds peanuts if you are providing, you can provide in very small quantities and sometimes as only as treats, not as main diet. So the other thing is behavioral enrichment. In wild, most of the time they uh, spend foraging for food and exercising and interacting with the um, uh, members of the flock. So you have to try to uh, replicate this behavior in captivity. So they are very social animals, so they can easily get the board and they are very intelligent animals. So by adding uh, toys and different furniture and interacting with them can uh, make them, you can keep them entertained and uh, like uh, active throughout the, during that period without uh, getting them bored because this boredom can lead to a lot of behavioral stereotypic behaviors. Sometimes when they, if they develop those behaviors, sometimes it's really difficult to get them out of it. And the uh, once one bird uh, develops uh, stereotypic behavior, sometimes others also will learn from that bird. So you have to make sure that uh, diagnosis is very important when birds come to you. You have to question the owner and find out the cause, not just thinking if you if you get a bird with uh, like if you see a bird with uh, loss of feather, just don't jump into conclusions thinking it's an infection or a viral disease or something. It could be a behavioral issue. And these uh, when the birds are stressed out, as I told you earlier, which which is a chronic stress, which will uh, reduce their immunity. So these are some of the uh, behavioral enrichment methods. It's like you, know, you can be creative and introduce anything, but make sure that you need to promote their natural behavior, not abnormal behaviors. So you need to know the normal behavior of the, you know, the species you rare uh, and uh, then try to promote that, that behavior. So these are some of the things. You can be very creative and do things. So these, these are pine cones with the 
uh, stuffed food particles and cardboard boxes which you can put the food inside so the bird has to work and get the food out and uh, this is kind of a food puzzle kind of a thing so the bird has to rotate and find the hole and then put the beak in and uh, pick food items from there and you can also have uh, frozen uh, food items like you can freeze fruits uh, and then keep it in the cage so that they can they can uh, try to pick the uh, food particles from that and you can even caramelize sugar and put a lot of different varieties of seeds there and let it uh, get hardened and you can put it in the cage and you can even put corn cobs not just giving corn uh, seeds just give corn cobs for them just hang it in different parts of the cage so bird can fly onto it and then pick uh, seeds from them that and in small birds like love birds, vajrigas, and even cockatiels, you can put uh, grass uh, flowers. You can use green grass flowers where uh, they can play and perch and swing and they can eat seeds. And they can cut leaves because par parrots, parrots have a behavior like they like to cut uh, branches and leaves and things. So they can do that behavior. And you can also use uh, a lot of uh, uh, toys and swings and perches and you can even have small uh, 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 like uh, wooden uh, toys as well as small hammocks and you can be creative and can add anything and but make sure that it doesn't harm your bird because when you introduce toys it could should be made of non-harmful substances because they leak onto it they chew on it so they can get chemical like uh, different uh, things into the body. So these uh, enrichment materials, the items you provide should be non-toxic as well as it just shouldn't harm the bird. Because sometimes these um, like uh, these uh, ropes and things can get frayed and those tiny thread-like things, bird can get entangled. The neck can the or the wings or the uh, legs can get entangled and which cause damage to the bird. So, and you have to provide enrichments, but make sure that they are in good condition and they are not uh, harming the bird and it's not, it's not made out of toxic uh, material. So deworming is also very important because you are keeping them in a small enclosure throughout their life. And uh, especially when you're keeping more than one bird there. And uh, the other thing is when you when they have like uh, large aviaries, outdoor aviaries, uh, not only worming the bird, but uh, you need to remove this top soil regularly and then replace it with sand or something which can be easily taken out and replaced. So no point just deworming the bird, but the environment has to be clean. Uh, and this outdoor environment, uh, because there is a, a possibility of contact with wild birds, this is very important. And uh, for before deworming, you can get, you can check the uh, fecal matter and see whether there are any parasites or uh, eggs, parasitic eggs. But as you all know, they the, even though the birds carry parasite, they don't always pass uh, eggs. So sometimes. You, uh, it's better if the bird is in a small enclosure and the uh, flock is kept in thin enclosure or outdoor enclosures, then better to do them then um, in once in three months. And these are some of the common dewormers you can use, but I have just given a general dosage. You have to uh, adjust the dosage depending on the size of the bird sometimes and the species. And especially river is all and uh, it's best if you can get the accurate weight of the bird before uh, starting uh, medication and river is all uh, uh, if you overdose it it can lead to nervous uh, issues so there are the other problem is household dangers for your bird so insecticides and pesticides are very like they are very susceptible to these uh, chemicals so you have to advise the client not to use uh, insecticides and pesticide sprays around your bird and uh, some of the fumes there are some fumes are toxic to them like teflon the uh, 
the Teflon coated the cooking utensils we use sometimes. So the when it get heated, the fumes that comes are very toxic to uh, cytosines, and they are very uh, sensitive to those fumes, as well as smoke. So if a household member is smoking, it's not uh, good. It's not good enough that he smoke in a different room because it can uh, spread all over the house. So if you are keeping a pet bird inside the house, they have to go out of the house and smoke if, you are, if they are smoking, because otherwise they will uh, inhale the smoke. And there are unhealthy or toxic food which shouldn't be given to uh, these parrots. Unhealthy means like high fat, high carbohydrate uh, food items uh, that can lead to obesity and fatty liver and which causes other systemic issues. And there are some toxic fruits, uh, food items like avocado, chocolate, alcoholic beverages, and tea, coffee, like beverages containing caffeine, and uh, onions, garlic, those things are not good for your, uh, their birth. So um, these uh, avocado contain some uh, uh, antifungal, came, antifungal, which can uh, lead to cardiac toxicity in birds, and theobromine can cause nervous signs in birds. And these uh, onions and garlic contain uh, uh, subs like uh, chemicals which cause gastric irritation and uh, ulcers. So you have to advise your uh, client uh, while providing a variety to avoid toxic and unhealthy food items in their diet. And electric cords are also very dangerous to these birds. They uh, all almost all parrots love to chew on things. So if the electric cords are like plugged down to the uh, power supply, they can get electrocuted while trying to chew on the electric cords. And ceiling fans, we get a lot of. Uh, I think some of you would have had that experience. The birds that are let uh, loose in the house, like get. Uh, injured due to the ceiling fan. So you, may, you have to advise them uh, to let uh, switch off the ceiling fans if they allow the pet uh, bird out of the cage. And bird toys. Bird toys are very important, but make sure that uh, they are made of uh, non-harmful substances and they don't contain like uh, particles that can come off and cause uh, problems with the bird, like sharp edges, uh, things with sharp edges and things like uh, uh, tiny uh, particles which can choke the bird if they swallow it accidentally. So the other thing is windows, doors and mirrors. So when you take the bird out of the cage and you have to make sure because they need exercise time. So you uh, have to advise the client to take the birds. Uh, there has to be a time that birds have to be taken out of the cage and let them loose around the house. So make sure that the windows and doors are closed uh, because otherwise the bird can fly out of the house and can uh, come into so many uh, dangers outside because the, um, they, sometimes these windows, the glass windows, glass pane uh, doors and the mirrors, they don't understand, they don't perceive that as a barrier. So they can crash onto those things and can also get damaged. While escaping, the other thing is they can crash onto it. So if you have windows and doors with glass, the best thing is to ask them to cover it, like with, put a curtain or if it is a mirror, put some uh, paste something on the mirror so the bird can see that there is a barrier. So other bits is another problem. The, in the house, if there are other pets like cats, dogs, and in Sri Lanka, we don't much rear snakes, but in some other countries, uh, they do have pet pythons and pet snakes. So it could cause harm to your, uh, this uh, pet uh, parrot. So you have to advise them uh, to be aware of these dangers in the uh, house to minimize uh, issues to the uh, pet bird. And some of the, most of the clients you may encounter will want to have a pet uh, companion, pet bird. But some of them will come to you seeking advice on breeding them. Because even though some start having them as pets, sometimes they, later they want to breed them or sometimes there are breeders who 
like rare the birds just for the breeding purpose and commercial purpose. So breeding uh, birds has to be kept apart from other pairs and non-breeding flocks. So uh, to minimize the disturbances and uh, there are the size of the cage aviary and the breeding area differs depending on the species and the size of the species and the behavior of the species. So there are some general guidelines for a medium-sized parrot, but if you really want to find out more details, you can uh, find those details. And uh, the birds uh, in flock birds can be reared in fairly uh, uh, confined spaces, but there are some very territorial birds, especially large birds, uh, which need much more space. And the male and female will need more uh, personal space. So you have to provide them with a larger uh, environment, like much more, much more spacious environment. And when you consider breeding, finding a compatible pair that will bond this, go, it's very difficult. Sometimes, uh, even though you keep pairs for years, they don't breed and there is no courtship behavior. The, so if uh, once you try, the, if the owner want to breed the birds, tell them that they, the main thing is they need to find a compatible pair. But once, if they have a pair and if the owner want to breed them, but there's no, uh, it's not successful, yeah, you can advise them to remove the male and introduce, try to introduce a new male. And, but always uh, advise them to remove the male because otherwise there'll be a aggression between males. Uh, so, uh, and it can cause, uh, problem to the other, even the female, when the males are fighting. And uh, in if, but if you are rearing flock birds, like cockatiels, budgetikas, and love birds, you can keep them in uh, flocks and they will get pair themselves. So you don't have to intervene in selecting breeding pairs. So they, if you want, you can keep them in a flock. And when you see the uh, pairs, so some commercial Breeders will take out, take those pairs out and then let them keep them in a separate cages or you can just let them be. And if there are enough nesting uh, area, there won't be an issue. Uh, so like even with the compatible pair, sometimes some like the be compatible uh, pair, sometimes they might stop breeding, like they might stop uh, uh, displaying courtship behavior in such cases uh, you can remove the uh, birds uh, like separate them uh, temporarily and then introduce them after the one or two weeks which will excite them and stim uh, stimulate breeding behavior so and the other thing is it's uh, uh, good that if you can provide with fresh fo foliage and mimic wild breeding habitats for them to uh, uh, like uh, uh, the breeding uh, to stimulate the be breeding uh, behavior. Uh, the, when you select a breeding pair, uh, like if you are introducing a male to a female, you have to do it very carefully. Sometimes, if you introduce incompatible pairs, sometimes they incompatible pairs. Sometimes they will fight, and both of them can get uh, seriously injured. So. Uh, what you can do is you can keep first, uh, you can keep them in two adjacent cages separated by a wire mesh with the one single perch running along the two cages. So you can see how they respond to each other. If they seem friendly, they will come close to the uh, wire mesh and they interact with each other through the mesh. If not, they will keep, uh, if they are totally disinterested, they will keep, uh, like they will not, you will not see any such behavior or you will see aggression. So from that, you can somewhat get some idea about the compatibility of the pair. Even though uh, you feel that they are compatible and then once you introduce them together, you have to carefully monitor them because uh, uh, all of a sudden the male can get can become aggressive and can attack the female. So for a period, you have to carefully monitor once they are introduced. So during breeding, there can be some issues. Um, uh, issues. So one is calcium deficiency. Not only breeding season, this is important throughout their life, like growing up period and laying period, feeding period, the calcium is very important. So best thing is to avoid calcium deficiency is to uh, hang uh, cuttlefish bones uh, in uh, different parts 
like uh, several places in the enclosure. So when they want, they can go and nibble on the uh, cuttlefish bone and they will get calcium. And so the other thing is environment for the breeding, environment has to be like uh, uh, very calm and quiet. And if, because if the males are stressed out, they can um, uh, attack the females or the uh, chicks or the eggs. So the disturbance, environmental disturbances can be human in, uh, interferences, other pets in the house or other birds of different species. So, and the other thing is if you keep breeding pairs close together, sometimes rival males, uh, if they can't get into each other, they will uh, uh, the, he take out his, their anger on the cage mate. So other thing is that like uh, the breeding nest boxes are very important uh, because as I told you earlier also, these uh, cytosines are prey species. So they are easily frightened, easily excitable, easily stressed out. So they should feel safe and secure and gloomy. So it's best to have deep, uh, uh, deep uh, nest boxes with the perch, perching um, uh, sand here. And so the um, female and the chicks will feel much more secure. So, um, and the entrance to the uh, nest box is also very important because uh, parrots, you know, in the wild, they, most of the parrots uh, nest in tree uh, holes. So there are few species which have uh, differences because there are some species which nest in termite uh, mounds and there are some species that they nest on rock crevices and uh, on even, even on the ground. And some species use nesting materials, some species don't. But most of them, uh, you, uh, in the wild, they uh, breed in tree holes. So they, uh, the entrance is very important. It has to be almost a similar size of the diameter of the body because parrots like to squeeze into the uh, nest boxes. So if you provide them a variety, they will always select such uh, nest boxes, but not the ones with the wide entrances. So uh, you can provide uh, the entrance is important, depth of the uh, nest box is important, and it depends, size depends on the species. And uh, if you want to monitor the behavior, you have to have a peephole. But the best thing is to have it somewhere on the side or the back, but not on the top. Because they are prey species and they are attacked by their predators from the top, they will get really frightened and stressed out if you try to peep from top. So have, have the peephole from a side. And then even though like if you're having it on a side and you quietly try to peep on them, monitor them, but if you feel that female gets stressed out while you try to do it, don't uh, peep on them, like uh, monitor them uh, too frequently. And this is, uh, there are clutch sizes vary in the, uh, depending on the species and larger birds uh, have, uh, small number of eggs and small birds lay more. Uh, I just put this for you to get some idea. And then uh, the, uh, the time it takes to hatch will also depend on the species. In large bird, it takes more time than the smaller birds. But don't, uh, if a client come to you and ask you advice again, uh, about this uh, hatching period and whether to try to remove the eggs, don't go and try to ask them to remove the eggs soon, immediately after the uh, state of the uh, specified uh, hatching period because uh, it all depends on the time the female start rooting them. So you can always wait for a few days and see whether uh, the eggs hatch. So there are some, some there are some, uh, sometimes the eggs fail to hatch due to various reasons. It could be the female and male are not uh, uh, not compatible, so they don't uh, uh, show uh, poetry behavior or no, or no uh, mating behavior. Or sometimes males are, um, you keep, sometimes most of the time they keep uh, pairs of the same sex because most of the citizens, you can't um, externally separate them. Like external 
appearance is the same in males and females, other than eclectus and few species of parrot. Eclectus, it's uh, com completely different. Males are green and females are red, red and blue. So, but most of them looks alike. So sometimes they keep the uh, pair, thinking it's a pair, they keep uh, two birds of the same sex. But bo if both are females, you can easily identify them because one both will start laying eggs. But if not, sometimes uh, the, you will not notice that the, the uh, two birds are of the same sex. The, the other thing is um, sometimes uh, females get too stressed out to brood the eggs because of the environmental disturbances. And also the first time uh, females sometimes just neglect the eggs or they won't like the due to their inexperience or stress. Sometimes male could be infertile, or sometimes it could be an issue with the nest box. You know, like it's not suitable for the species, the size and the shape is not suitable, or the eggs can fall off the next uh, nest and get uh, destroyed. So, and calcium deficiency also can lead to soft shells and which the eggs can easily get damaged. So there are different reasons for unsuccessful hatching. So you can, if there are such issues, you will be able to investigate the cause and then advise the client. And we'll move on to some other issues uh, we, we commonly encounter in uh, pet acid uh, science. One is uh, beak deformities. So abnormally overgrown upper beaks can cause a lot of uh, issues in the bird because then they can't eat properly. They can't, uh, the prehensile ability is not there. And uh, it could be due to underuse or it could be due to infections, diseases, or it could be due to inherited defects, uh, injuries, poor nutrition, or it could be due to the, like systemic infections like liver disease. So in a normal beak should be like this. Uh, shape is like this because top uh, part just slightly over um, uh, coming over the uh, lower beak and but in some species it's uh, sharper and longer and uh, in some uh, citizen species it's not this long so it you it's important that you uh, the kind then you know the normal shape of the beak of that for that species so this is a very overgrown scissor like beak and um, there are different other abnormalities also. So best thing, best way to uh, correct this is using a hand rip and using uh, a burr like this uh, to trim the uh, beak to the normal shape. But you have to be, do it very carefully because if you damage the bl blood vessels or the nerves, it would be very painful and it will start bleeding. So sometimes it's over, when it's overgrown, you can't directly go and trim to the exact shape. You might have to do it stepwise. And while using the hand drill, you have to make sure that it won't, it won't get overheated. So you might have to spray, spray say, line or water to cool it out and keep like, can't, like, you can't do it for a long period without like you are stressing the bird and it can get heated. So uh, you it gradually and carefully and uh, not to damage the, uh, Vessels or the nerves. And this big uh, deformities, one of the main issues is underuse. So, when you provide a lot of soft, uh, soft food items for them, only fruits and things, it can cause, uh, because of the underuse, it, the beaks can overgrow. So, cuttle, providing cuttlefish bones will provide calcium, plus, it will may help to grind the beaks. And for large birds, you can provide a variety of uh, wooden toys that they can chew on. So it will help to trim their beaks. And uh, when you provide food items also, you can provide uh, hard nuts because uh, special like large birds like macaws, their beaks are very strong. They can, uh, in the wild, they can crush nuts and take the uh, the pea, uh, edible peas. So you can provide something like coat tongue and like uh, nuts with hard shells which will help to uh, be, be clear. And uh, mites, uh, burrowing mites are also uh, important uh, issue where um, 
you have to investigate in your own weeks. So um, you can uh, identify the mite, like uh, you can see the scaly appearance, uh, not only weak overgrowth, and uh, you can examine the mic, uh, those uh, skin lesions, like uh, those uh, scaly parts you can remove and then examine under the microscope, and then you can see the mite. Uh, so uh, the normal treatment is uh, ivermectin, you can give it orally or you can apply it uh, topically in diluted in propylene glycol. And the other thing is you can apply like uh, soften the crust you, using something uh, like aloe vera gel uh, and then remove, but make sure that you don't occlude the neas. And if the crusts are like uh, covering the airflow, you have to uh, very small, like very slowly, carefully clean the neas and you can restore the airflow. And uh, if the if these mites uh, these mites I will talk about it later also in parasitic uh, diseases. So, but these mites uh, can cause problems around the eyes as well as uh, legs and sometimes around the vent. So, if there are large sores or the if it is uh, if it is very uh, the around the eyes and the legs are very like hard, scaly like, you can apply some antibiotic uh, ophthalmic ointment, but make sure that it doesn't uh, like uh, spread onto the uh, feathers. Uh, and then uh, if there are open sores, you can even start oral antibiotics and non-steroidal analgesics like uh, meloxicam uh, to alleviate the pain and the inflammation. Egg binding is another issue that you would encounter. It is also a husband issue most of the time, like stress and allowing poor condition birth, females to breed and lack of exercise and adequate nesting facilities and obesity also can lead to this. So most of these issues, as I told you, can be avoided with proper husband practices. So treatment, uh, as a first treatment, you can put the bird in like uh, a warm, lukewarm water, uh, um, water bath and or keep the bird in a steaming bathroom for one or two hours to see whether the, the bird will pass the egg. If not, you can try lubricating and gently massaging the egg out. And uh, if that also fails, you can uh, like spray the egg contents with a needle and then remove the shell parts carefully without damaging the reproductive tract. But um, the diet, you can all do uh, do all this if the egg is in the latter part of like close to the cloaca. But if it is a proximal part, sometimes diagnosis also will be difficult. You have, might have to take an X-ray and then uh, go for the surgical removal. In uh, some, uh, like you can even give calcium injections if you suspect calcium deficiency or uh, oxytocin also can be given. But you have to make sure that. Uh, egg it's like not complicated uh, egg binding because egg, if the egg is attached to or if there are oviduct inflammation or something then uh, ov this uh, oviduct can get ruptured if you give uh, oxytocin so before giving that you have to diagnose the condition properly and then start treatment and feather loss uh, could be a, due to a true uh, feather loss or could be because the bird itself or cage mate is plucking feathers. So if it is a true feather loss, then it could be an infection or it could be related to malnutrition, hormonal imbalance, uh, obesity, tumors. But if it is uh, like feather plucking, it is due to it's a, a stereotypic behavior which will be uh, will which will uh, the bird will start it because of the border. So, uh, like for them, but most of the parrots like uh, bathing. So you can like miss the um, uh, miss the cage and miss the bird, or you can use a shower to bathe them. It all depends on the frequency, depend on the birds liking. Because some birds love to bathe, so you can bathe them, and you can ask the owners to bathe them in the shower. So it will improve the uh, uh, appearance of the plumage. And true feather loss, you have to identify what's the cause and then treat for that. 
and it can be due to viruses, bacteria, parasites, or other systemic diseases. So uh, the traumatic injuries are also very common in uh, pet citizens. So uh, one thing could be, it could be attacked by cage mates. So that's why you have to monitor uh, the behaviors because even in flock uh, species, sometimes some, some birds could be subordinate, some could be dominant birds are there. So uh, you have to monitor the behavior. And if you feel that one bird is getting attacked by others, you have to remove the bird and, uh, and keep them separated or then see why he's been attacked. Because sometimes due to health issues, the, the and the bird is weak, then other birds can attack them. So you have to monitor the behavior to identify these uh, problems. And then they can get entangled in uh, the cage, like broken wire mesh or toys or something. So if the if it is a cause, you have to treat the bird and correct the uh, cage and the, remove the uh, in, uh, injurious uh, uh, toys. And sharp edges in the cage can you have to monitor the cage and see that it's uh, void of sharp objects and edges and the predators, especially in outdoor enclosures, um, uh, like the predatory birds are there. So the, I have experience because in Sri Lanka there are like urban small um, uh, birds of prey called shikrais. Yeah, they that bird comes and just takes the legs of the birds when they are perching on the wire mesh. So you have to make sure that uh, these are those things are not happening. Uh, and when you get an injured bird, you have to treat those injuries very carefully because bird skin is very sensitive and very thin and is, can be easily teared. So the, the wound treatment has to be done very carefully. And when you dress, don't make it too heavy. You have to dress it very lightly using uh, like uh, something uh, and lightly plus you can use something like coban but the because the stretchable bandage can get uh, constricted when it get wet you have to make sure that uh, it doesn't uh, uh, obstruct the bl blood supply to the other part of the distal part part of the limb or the wing so but make it very light so the bird can otherwise but it's balancing is also difficult and bird will feel it, um, like very uncomfortable and the other thing is, is best thing is to wear a collar so that the bird can't remove the dressing. Um, uh, you can uh, put a like something like a button collar, uh, but make sure that the bird can eat with the collar. But if you feel that bird can't uh, eat properly with the collar, because we have had such uh, complaints from the clients, bird is not eating when its uh, collar is worn. So you have to remove the collar, let the bird eat, and then put it back after eating. And we'll more, I'll, I'm going to briefly describe on some of the infectious diseases. Uh, like uh, mainly these diseases, I'm telling again and again, all because of uh, poor husband conditions and hard environmental uh, stresses. So. And the quarantine is very, very important because once you have, like once a client have birds, when you, if they are introducing new birds, they has to be kept, the, the, the owners has to be advised not to directly put new birds with the um, existing birds. They have to keep separated. They have to be treated with dewormers. They have to be treated with external, uh, for, uh, treated for external parasites if uh, possible. And the, these birds, when the birds are purchased, it has to be from a reputed uh, person. And then uh, keep, keep them at least two months separated and then gradually introduce. But after the treat, treating the, uh, for the diseases and uh, disease issues, health issues, the behavioral issues also has to be monitored. Once you introduce the new bird, you have to make sure that it won't get attacked from the other birds. So after introduction, you have to monitor that also. So uh, quarantine is uh, also very important to minimize uh, infectious diseases. So see, the there are a lot of bacterial diseases. One is ointosis, which is a zoonotic disease. 
uh, in this disease, uh, sometimes the uh, birds are asymptomatic and they will start showing the signs. Yeah, yeah. They are yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and they will uh, start showing signs when they are under some kind of stress. So uh, the drug of choice for this disease is uh, doxycycline, and it's long, like it's a long-term treatment. Uh, usually, about one and a half months you need to treat if you diagnose this disease. And there are so many other bacterial diseases I'm not going to talk about all. Uh, but most of these uh, diseases respond well to antibiotics. But uh, best thing is to culture and get the ST results before uh, treatment. You can start treating if you feel that you can't wait for the laboratory uh, test results, but start with a like, first line treatment and then uh, move on to a specific antibiotics if that particular the treatment you are um, doing uh, is not uh, uh, effective. So when you get uh, sick birds, you have to examine them really well. And in most of in most of these cases, other than tuberculosis, uh, most of these uh, bacterial infections you can uh, treat treat with uh, and uh, effective antibiotics. And uh, almost all of these can be prevent preventable prevented uh, through good husband practices. In tuberculosis, you might have to destroy the birds if it is diagnosed because uh, it's a health, a health issue to other animals also. Because some, uh, uh, some uh, tuberculosis bacteria are also zoonotic. The, uh, and see, most of the uh, okay, I will tell that later. And some these are the more common, like. Uh, antibiotics we can use for birds. I, I have just mentioned it so that you can get an idea about the dose rates, but these doses can have to be adjusted depending on the species and some species are more uh, sensitive to some antibiotics. So when before you start treating, you have to check uh, the um, uh, species uh, that uh, whether this antibiotic can be used for that particular species of birds. Although all of them are citizens, some, uh, there, there are different species variations. And when you uh, treat them, uh, best thing is to, uh, uh, you can even give the injections. If you are giving injectables, you have to give it to the breast muscles because those are the most uh, like thick muscles in the bird's body. And if you are giving oral uh, treatments, you have to make sure that uh, you can give it with the, uh, directly or directly to the mouth or you can put it in the water or food but uh, then you might have to uh, uh, add more because uh, bird will not eat the whole uh, fruit or the uh, water and you don't want to underdose the antibiotic so viral diseases are also there the one is uh, bajriga fledging disease uh, caused by a polyoma virus. Uh, this is uh, this the, uh, this is uh, not uh, only affect bacterias. Uh, this can this virus can affect others. This virus causes skin tumors and warts, and cause uh, like feather issues in birds. And um, when the this normally birds get this uh, disease, the virus uh, through uh, hand feeding or the, when the parents feed the young ones, uh, the regurgitate contain the virus and the young ones also get affected. So they uh, like, uh, uh, these clinical signs include the uh, uh, distended abdomen and the, this uh, virus, has, this disease has high mortality and there's um, uh, tail uh, issues and feather issues, dehydration, and when you examine the cloacal region, uh, normally, when they have diarrhea, you can see the uh, like uh, pasted feathers around the vent. You can see it's like uh, uh, fecal material is has uh, uh, pasted the feathers. But in this condition, you can see urine, not the droppings, which had uh, soiled the uh, the 
feathers around the vent and skin can become reddened and hemorrhages can be seen. And most of, if the disease is acute, you can see the full crop is full. So that, that means the bird has been eating and the condition has progressed quickly. And uh, the, the, another disease, another viral disease, which is common and recently also I, I, I was informed about the case, uh, oh, proventricular dilatation disease. This is frequently fatal disease affecting the nervous system caused by, uh, caused by an avian bona virus. And the birth, uh, like early signs would be, the, uh, all the, the, the main campaign would be the bird is eating but losing weight drastically. And sometimes they uh, develop diarrhea, sometimes they develop neurological signs and vomiting, regurgitation. So uh, most of the time, when you, by the time you examine the bird, you will see the like severe weight loss. Uh, so, and the, if you do a PM of a dead bird, you can see the enlarged uh, proventriculus. And it's very prominent, so you can easily identify it. And you can do even histopath, if you send the samples for histopath, you can identify the, confirm the disease. Uh, the treatments, uh, include with the for this disease the symptomatic treatment. You have to go for symptomatic treatments, and you sometimes you have to give antibiotics to prevent secondary bacterial infections, and sometimes you have to give anti-inflammatory drugs to reduce the inflammation. But best thing is to mean like quarantine new uh, introduction of new any birds to prevent the introduction of disease into your the clients' uh, birds existing birds. And external parasites are also common. Um, I told you earlier, uh, the burrowing mites are there, lice are there. Normally in the wild, they carry a lot of lice, but in, uh, they, are, they are not that harmful to birds, but in captivity, if the bird is under some kind of stress and if they, are, if they have some other systemic diseases, sometimes these external parasites also can flare up, causing problems. So they the bird can be treated with uh, ivermectin or moxidectin. They are, earlier, there used to be sprays. Even now, there are uh, sprays that contain pyrethrins, which are toxic to birds. So sometimes, uh, even if you like uh, uh, do the treatment recommended as the, by the manufacturer, sometimes there are incidences that, uh, which, which had harmed the birds. So clients are reluctant to use it, and even the vets are reluctant to or use uh, recommend, like uh, prescribe such items. And there are also a uh, lot of uh, uh, sprays that claim to be effective, which contains blend of natural oils. So because I have not used it, so I, have, I don't know about the effectiveness of uh, such uh, natural oils. Uh, and, uh, but if you are treat, even though you are treating the bird, you have to make sure that you clean the environment really well uh, and use an in uh, insecticide and remove the bird and start uh, clean the environment with an insecticide and keep uh, you know, or remove like wash it really well with water and remove all traces of the insecticide or keep it for a while, can transfer the bird to a different cage for a period and then later introduce the bird because the environment has to be really clean, no point just treating the bird. As soon as you put, unless you clean the environment, you once you put the bird back to the cage, bird will again contact the same issue. So this I talked earlier during that uh, feather loss, uh, uh, feather, one of the causes for feather loss is uh, uh, Nimidopter, uh, mites. They are burrowing mites, which can infest it, uh, um, like be causing weak deformities and it can affect the uh, surrounding area of the eyes, vent, feet. So I have discussed it earlier. And protozoan diseases are also common. Mm, uh, coccidiosis is a common uh, finding and viadiasis is also common in parrots. So uh, there are some species, uh, species which are more susceptible like cockatiels, cockatoes and parakeets especially young ones. 
and you can easily diagnose this condition by examining a fecal sample under microscope. And there are different treatments, as you will know, the uh, sulfur trimethyl cream or metronidazole, toltrazuril, or can be given to birds. And depending on the species, you need to adjust the dose rate. And worms are also there. This also I uh, uh, discussed earlier, but I just want to tell you that there are some worms uh, we, uh, which earthworms are the intermediate host of that parasi parasites. So especially if you are rearing your birds outside aviaries, they have to be uh, careful about the earthworms uh, because uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, intermediate hosts can uh, continuously uh, infect the, like uh, infect the birds with the uh, GIT worms. And the other thing is you have to uh, be careful about the other, other, uh, other uh, pests like rats, mice, cockroaches, which can bring uh, like uh, worm, worm uh, eggs and the larvae to the your bird the enclosure. So fungal diseases is another problem, but uh, in tropical countries, you find fungus everywhere in the environment. Uh, most common fungi are aspergillus species and candida species. And, but main uh, causes, fun fungus could be a secondary cause. Main cause is poor husbandry, as I told you, so, told you several times, overcrowding, poor nutrition, poor sanitation, poor ventilation, and so many uh, like concurrent infections could lead to fungal secondary fungal diseases. So itraconazole can be used, uh, which have less side effects than some of the other antifungals, but uh, you have to rectify the main issue. Uh, without that, no point just treating for these diseases. So once you get a bird, the pet, if you, uh, once you get a sick bird, examine it clearly well, Get the history like for any other animal. Uh, get the history. Sometimes you might have to visit the house. I personally prefer visiting the house and examining the cages and the diet and the environment before start treatments. Because sometimes you get uh, the just examining the bird will not give up overall idea about the cause of the problem. So you might have to visit the place. So, but if you once you get the bird just examine it as any other animals as if you would for a dog or a cat uh, body con you have to uh, examine the body condition body condition uh, can be measured by the uh, like if you palpate the uh, muscles uh, on either side of the like pectoral muscles on either side of the keel bone you can get an idea about the body condition and then you need to get the weight uh, and then examine the eyes and the nose and the vent Check whether there are any pasted feathers around the wind cloaca, so you can get an idea about the, uh, the condition of the consistency of the stools and the legs uh, to check whether there are any other injuries other than the main complaint the client is giving you and the uh, breathing pattern and you can examine the lungs, you can um, auscultate the lungs and then check for the wings and other like for external parasites before diagnosing a disease. And sometimes you might have to send sample for culture or uh, check for parasites before start treatment. So best thing is examine the bird well, get the history, and then sometimes go to the site and visit it and check for husband conditions and get uh, an overall idea about the environment where the bird is in, and then, uh, then start treatment. The other thing is tell the client that uh, when they transfer the bird, like uh, transfer the bird, like you need to cover the cage with the cloth or something so the bird will feel, uh, feel secure. So it, it's gloomy and bird will feel secure. And then uh, the other thing is uh, make sure when you advise them on husbandry, I forgot to tell you that where you keep the cage in the house is also important. So some birds will love to perch like higher area, so they will feel much secure. The, but much more social bird species might want to stay on the same level as us, so they can interact with other uh, uh, members in the house and frequently 
uh, observe what's going on around there. But, and that also depend on the so behavior of the species. So you have to understand the species before like advise them on husbandry. And the other thing is they need a very good sleep. So the, uh, no, they, because they are prey species, they are very vigilant about the noises and the lights in the environment. So no point just covering the cage with the cloth. So these birds have to be kept in a separate area for sleeping because no, if you keep the fellow in your room and then you work in the till middle of the night and keep the bird covered, cage covered with the cloth thinking he will go to sleep, that will not happen. So the bird will hear you, bird will uh, hear all the noises you make and it will not sleep. So that can cause a lot of stress, which lead to immune suppression in the bird in the long run. So take care of like you have to advise the client on all these so the other thing is when you care for sick birds that you have to keep it's a bit like environment on the warmer side so uh, the but don't make it too warm because they can get overheated very easily so best thing what you can do is ask the client to put a, a small like 60 watt 80 watt bulb in a corner of the cage outside because I told you earlier, they love to chew on uh, electrical wires and things. So keep it, keep the bulb outside the uh, cage in a corner or just uh, uh, heat small, like uh, that won't emit a lot of heat. Uh, so if the bird wants heat, he can go near to the bulb. And if he want, doesn't want it, he can move away from it. So some kind of heat source has to be there when they are sick, so they can be much warmer and feel uh, like what it will feel much warm. And the humidity is important, but in our country, it's not that important because uh, most of the time we have uh, uh, humidity is not that of a problem in our uh, parts. And fluids, sometimes when the birds are not eating and drinking, they can become dehydrated. So you might have to uh, give subcut fluid. When you give subcut fluid, give to an area somewhere like axilla, so where there's enough space. Don't give large quantity to the to one area. And depending on the size of the bird, you have to calculate the volume you need to give. And then uh, give it lukewarm. Don't give it like cold saline. And then, uh, then get them to start, like sometimes you have to feed them. Uh, syringe feed or with a crop needle you need to force feed them till they start eating normally and the other thing is uh, oh and you can add uh, fruit juices or glucose or you can provide uh, king coconut water for them to drink because it's much more palatable than water uh, so uh, the other thing is uh, nutrition i told you it you have to provide them like feed them with the uh, easily digestible simple carbohydrates during the recovery period and keep the le level of activity really quiet without disturbances for so the bird can get enough sleep and he can get enough rest but continuously moni monitor the fellow and don't encourage uh, playing behavior remove the toys and sometimes you have to isolate the bird uh, into a, and keep the sick bird in a separate area. That is important because if it is an infectious disease, it will prevent uh, spreading the disease to the other uh, birds in the aviary. And it will also keep this uh, like sick bird separated, be calm, and see, he doesn't have to worry about the other cage mates. And uh, so you can keep the bird in a separate enclosure till he recovers. So I think that's it. Um, and if you have any questions, I would, I'm pleased to answer those. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ganga. It's very informative and uh, very simplified, the presentation. And uh, we have a few questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I can present them. The first question is, uh, how about the effectiveness of uh, piperacin, which is a uh, common deworm in poultry on roundworms in uh, cytosine birds? Yeah, it is effective, but uh, like you can give like more than, you can give piperacin. We have given piperacin and it won't 
cause any toxic effects or anything. But uh, Prasiquantel, that because it's only if, uh, effective against roundworms. So um, Prasiquantel plus pyrantine, like uh, anyway, you have to alternate dewormers. You can't give the same dewormer over and over again. So piperacine also can be given, but uh, don't give the same dewormer every time, alternate the dewormer. Sometimes you can even give albendazole if they are not like uh, feeding chicks and all. Okay. And the uh, second question, I think you have already answered, but uh, we present it again. Uh, how to advise clients on sexing of different species? Sexing sometimes, but looking at them externally, it's not possible to sex them, but you can do feather sexing. You can, there are companies that uh, do, they do feather sexing. You can uh, remove a feather shaft so they can, uh, you can send it to those lab uh, laboratories. The companies are there. They will sex the bird. And sometimes earlier, they like especially birds of not citizens uh, specifically, but you can do laparotomy and uh, like uh, endoscopic kind of thing to uh, sex the birds. But it's more invasive. So feather sexing or take a blood drop and send it to a, a to for testing laboratory is the best. Right. Third question. I don't know. The, uh, the third one is how we get the samples of zoo animals especially lions for corona infection. Same mess as all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's nothing to do with citizens, but yes. you can get yeah. samples. You can get samples from zoo animals, lions, you can easily do because you can get rectal swabs and uh, fecal samples because uh, uh, in the zoo, the, all these lions, all the carnivores are uh, taken into dens for feeding in the night, although they are in outside the enclosure during the day. So once they are taken into the den, and then uh, in the morning, uh, uh, the animals are put out into the enclosure and you can go in and separately collect uh, fecal, fresh fecal samples from uh, subs from each animal. No, you, can individual, you can identify the individual samples. But, and the other thing is uh, you have to collect it uh, quickly because you can't like uh, collect, uh, no point collecting old samples. But uh, normally after the carnivores feed, only they defecate. So they feed in the night and then they, they defecate. But early morning when we put them out, we can collect a fresh sample. And you can, if you squeeze, put the animal into a squeeze cage, you can even get uh, nasal, nasal subs, even oral subs using a, you know, like modified uh, subs, like with a long uh, handle, something using something okay. instrument with a long handle. Yeah. The fourth question is restraining and anesthetic management in attending minor surgeries. Uh, best thing is to minor surgeries. If it, if it is causing pain, you have to anesthetize it. Uh, like restraining is you can use towels. You can, uh, towel is the best actually for like minor procedures like uh, claw, nail clipping like things or feather, feather clipping if uh, you want. But if surgery is because of the pain, I would advise to go for general anesthesia. So using isoflurane is the safest. Okay. The fifth question is, uh, can we give a drontal for birds? I think referring mm -hmm. to the brand. Yeah. That you, I can't give brand names. Drontal, yes. uh, yeah. The combination, combination. Yeah. combination, you have to check then the because of the synergistic effect and all, you can prasicontal, you can give separately. Mebenazole, you can give separately. Pyrantol, you can do it separately. Fenvenazole, you can give separately. But combination, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer for that question. Right. The last question is, uh, when we uh, give antibiotic in drinking water, can we use the same uh, dissolving rates recommended for poultry? Not always. No. It depends on the species. Even citizens. There's a range is like there's a like a high range because uh, in some some species are very sensitive so some antibiotics cannot be given to some species so not all antibiotics that are given to poultry can be given to uh, birds sometimes they can be given but you have to adjust the dose rate so I can recommend you like there are a lot of formularies the 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 book I really like is Avian Medicine uh, Technical Techniques and Applications, I think, uh, by R Richie Harrison and Harrison. If someone is really interested in avian medicine, I would advise you to get that book. 
and it oh, contains we have another question. Okay, we have another question. Uh, what should we use to expel the fleas? Uh, what are the causes for feather pecking and treatment for the condition? Feather plucking is the stereotypic behavior. Mainly, it can be the birds can pluck feathers due to irritation also due to external parasites. But most of the time, it's due to boredom. Like birds are in a like uh, where birds are not uh, birds don't have enough activity and they don't have enough uh, stimulating environment, and they it's kind of a stereotypic behavior and they will develop it and. Sometimes you have to, there are some successors using uh, behavioral modification drugs like haloperidol and diazepam. Uh, but uh, some in some animals, it's really, really difficult to cure once they develop the stereotypic behavior. Uh, so sometimes you have to, you don't have much uh, treatment. Even haloperidol answers for some and diazepam also uh, have been effective, but not for all the cases. But for external parasites, uh, as I told you earlier, there are a lot of sprays uh, in different companies, like uh, uh, sprays made of uh, made for parrots. Most of them, some of them contain pyrethrins, some of them contain uh, uh, natural oils and oil blends, as I told you earlier. So the natural oil blends ones, I'm not sure because I have not used it. They might be effective, but I can't comment on that. But pyrethrin ones I have used, and some in some birds it hadn't caused any problem. But some birds can die. So even if you use with the recommended dose, the fleas may uh, you have to lice and mites, everything you have to keep the environment clean. If you practice good hygienic practices and mean quarantine, follow quarantine procedures, you can prevent those uh, issues. Okay, I think uh, that's all uh, questions. We don't have any more questions. Uh, uh, dear Secretary, are we going for the uh, questions uh, now? The other questions? Dr. Sanjay Vasan, someone is raising hand. Okay. Check it. Uh, Dr. Ganga. Hi, yes, Masha. It's me. Uh, Dr. Ganga, uh, in our practice, we have a common problem basically like that uh, the uh, the people, they want, when they want to like raise quickly the birds, actually the young, younger ones, so they are feeding actually cages with the, uh, like with the made syringes using bicycle tubes, valves like, so it's a common problem like, you know, accidentally the birds like uh, eat that and when it struggle, you know, it's stuck in the crop area, but sometimes it's go more beyond the crop area. So how do you recommend to uh, take it basically? If it is in the crop, you can externally manipulate and get the uh, tube out. The main thing is you have to, have to advise them to, if it happens, to bring the bird immediately to, to the clinic before you go beyond the crop. I have seen the surgeries which have been done to remove the uh, feeding tubes from distal part of the GI tract and it is successful, you can easily do it, but it is an invasive surgery. So it have to be like uh, surgically skilled to do that. But if the, as soon as the birds swallow the tube, if the client bring the fellow to the clinic, you can externally manipulate and uh, remove it through the mouth. So main thing is to advise them. Yeah, can like they can, can we advise to uh, fix the tube also using a gum like, an, uh, like uh, uh, something like very uh, binding thing because like it's uh, repeatedly happening and we don't know how to advise them because even you know I found like it happened second time you know first time we took it out and again the same person gave like uh, without our advice and repeatedly the second time even we have taken so the you can fix it but the problem is then how to clean it sometimes the cleaning will be an issue so it can it can cause so many other issues then. So if the feeding and the other thing is you have to advise them not to like uh, separate the young birds from the parents at early stage and start feeding. It can later lead to uh, behavioral issues. So best thing is to let the parents feed and then get the like get the bird uh, socialized with humans at a young age which will reduce behavioral issues later in the life. 
So uh, feeding, if the bird, like that must be young birds. They must be feeding the young birds, aren't they? Not yes, yes. Birds. Basically, uh, macaws we found and cockatoo. Mm -hmm. yeah, why, yeah, why are they feeding Quite them? Expensive. Have they, have they like, separated the, the birds from the young ones? Right. From the Okay. Yes, yes, mother, because handmade handmade birds basically like that they are hand feeding and uh, yeah, Katie, the feeding, the, the commercial thing is for them, commercial, even for commercial ones. Huh. Now, the best advice is for them to let the parents uh, feed the birds when they are very young and then so like gradually socialize the young ones with the humans so they will get used to the humans as well and they will learn things from the parents and they psychologically that. They will be much more um, sound birds and they will not have uh, behavioral issues later in their life. So you uh, can replace the fixing part if they can clean it really. But if okay, other than not that, doctor, then... yeah, Dr. Ganga, other than that, that you know that they have already brought the uh, the the birds actually. So uh, then actually, can we advise to use that small syringes without giving that uh, the tubes, or is that advisable? You can. There are crop needles. They can buy. They can. Ask uh, no, no, not the needle one. Just a plain syringe without a needle. The one cc no, no, syringe no. or something. Yeah, there are there are crop uh, like there are steel kind syringe like needle type of bird feeding parrot feeding ah. uh, thing uh, needles crop needles available in available. Ah, okay. So they can okay. import them. It's a okay. You can even easily uh, get it from Singapore, Australia, or somewhere. So there are crop needles. You can feed, feed. It is like easy to clean, and it is it. The bird can't swallow that. At like very like made of hard hard material, and even if they swallow, uh, like if the same person is doing it repeatedly, you have to advise the person to chain the caretaker because they oh. he he's not play, paying attention while feeding the bird. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ganga. A nice presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Do uh, we have any other questions? Yeah, Dr. Ganga, Lakhmat is here. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's very nice presentation and very informative. So uh, I just want to get one opinion from you that uh, you mentioned about that uh, heavy infestation of uh, lice, mites, and uh, fleas infestation. So if it is a generalized, so what is the actual way to apply the ivermectin topical? So if it is uh, about the neck only, or about the generalized thing, the diluted diluted ivermectin. Generalized like mite infestation. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean alopecia, alopecia. If it is alopecia, alopecia thing, uh, yeah. You have to first identify the cause for alopecia. Although it looks like alopecia, it could be feather plucking. So what's the way we? I mean, if it is due to mites or lice, so what's the actual way we need to apply about the neck? Oh, oh, no, the, no. I mean, I mean, first, the... Lakna, first you need to diagnose the cause. Because if it is just feather pluck, if, if it is a behavioral issue or hormonal issue, there are hormonal issues also. So if it is something like that, no point applying um, ivermectin or anything. So find first find the cause. And if it is a mite thing, ivermectin will help. You can even give orally. Or you can uh, apply topically if it is only in a small part. Otherwise, you can give uh, moxidexin. I, I'm not sure whether it's available in Sri Lanka now. Uh, but I make clean, you can give orally even if it is generalized. Uh, but pyrethrin sprays are also used to be available in the country, uh, which are not registered. I think maybe hand carried or something to the country, but uh, it was available for uh, like most of the pet shops in Col around Colombo. I have seen it. Uh, pyrethrin uh, containing uh, external parasitic sprays made for parrots. Uh, which are effective, but sometimes it, some birds, it's not uh, like some birds have died because of, like using that, uh, even with the recommended, uh, uh, using recommended dose and recommended use, uh, sprayed it from the distance that the manufacturer recommends. So that's a problem. You, uh, otherwise, ivermectin can be given orally or if it is just localized, you can uh, uh, dilute it and apply ivermectin. 
and they yes, and they recommend uh, paraffin liquid paraffin also or just vaseline on like especially on the feet if uh, feet if you if feet are scaly and if you suspect mite infestation feet you can apply that but don't apply on the feathers because uh, all these oils will stuck the feathers and then bird will have problems in uh, thermoregulation Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience, the participants? Okay, Ranga, Dr. Ranga, I'm Dr. Randi. Yes, yes. Thank, thank, you. yes. thank you very much. It's really impressive your presentation. You know, you covered the entire thing of management and diseases and you know special concerns of our, our uh, veterinarians. And my, I have a little question that. Uh, the sexing with blood samples and it is not only laboratory in our country to send these samples uh, for sexing uh, as you mentioned Dr. Ganga Gene tech can but Gene tech, tech. Gene ah. tech yeah so uh, you can transport in these EDTA tubes or so just, just a plain plain tube right uh, yeah EDTA tube or sometimes they you know, like the blood the the sampling blood of blood paper, how to transport the... uh, for oh, sexing yeah. Dr. Yes, sometimes you need to check with gene tech because I have not sent samples to them. But in most of the countries, they get uh, blood drops, uh, impregnated blotting paper type of things. You don't need large blood volumes for the same. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, just pluck to like feathers. Yeah, my other question. But uh, check with gene tech. They will let you know yeah. how to send samples. And my other question is, you were telling about this tubicular of tubicular of birds, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so I mean, it's there, it's there, yeah, you know, uh, diagnosing method for the as veterinarians where when you're presented with a bird in your, on your clinic. Sorry, Ranka, I didn't get the question. How to diagnose the tuberculosis? What is going yeah. on? Yeah, ah, you can say. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, so yeah, how, how do you? Sometimes you might not be able to diagnose it when they are alive, you because they you don't they, there are no pathognomonic clinical signs of tuberculosis. But uh, the other thing okay. is, I forgot to mention is uh, you like if you have uh, if the clients have large number of birds and when they start dying, the, uh, tell them to bring the uh, birds for PM postmortems. So you can do the PM and su submit samples. You can submit samples to the faculty uh, in Canada. Uh, Dr. Rasikas lab, they do uh, mycobacterium uh, investigations. So they do for birds as well. Oh. Oh, otherwise, culture for culture, you can send it to the well, like Valisara, just human hospital, uh, human clinic. But more than culture, I think that the, like sometimes you won't diagnose it when they are alive because sometimes uh, you you think it's something else and not only tuberculosis, sometimes with the tuberculosis, there are some other, you find some incidental uh, findings are there, so you can misdiagnose. But best thing is uh, to do the PEMs of sick birds and then you can identify the, uh, you can uh, send samples for histopaths and culture or even PCR. In Rascal's lab, they do PCR. Okay, thank you very much. And, uh... I think uh, we don't have any more questions from the audience. The, uh, then the last part, uh, we can move on to the uh, vote of thanks from the Secretary of uh, Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, Dr. Sugat Premichandra. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vasala. Uh, Dr. Randi Kunaradana, the President of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, uh, Dr. Ganga Vijay Singha, our resource person today. Dear doctors, Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, I take this opportunity to extend our most sincere gratitude to uh, Dr. Ganga Vijay Singha, who accepted our invitation as resource person despite her busy schedule. We believe that the knowledge we have shared will help immensely to improve the knowledge of the veterinarian in the different part of the world. And also, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sanjay Vasala you did a great job as a moderator. And also, I would like to thank all the doctors uh, who participated today, uh, especially from the foreign countries, uh, Philippines, 
Singapore uh, and other countries, USA. Thank you very much for participation uh, to success the today webinar. And also I would like to invite you all to participate for the next event on next Sunday, uh, Common Sterile Diseases and Treatment uh, on su su 25th Sunday at 1 p.m. Sri Lankan time. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you all. Thank you very much all. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.